Greetings and salutations. Let's take a look at the Ubuntu user statistics for October 2018. It has been six months since Ubuntu 1804 long-term support was released. Shortly before that was released in April, Ubuntu announced that they would add a feature to the installer that would collect a little bit of anonymous information that would be sent back to Canonical, the company that distributes Ubuntu, so that the developers could have some idea of what kinds of system of Ubuntu was being installed on and how users were setting it up. This caused a bit of a stink, of course, because there were people out there who said, oh, they're going to collect information that can, you know, make them so they can figure out your kids' names and things like that. No, 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 no. This is very, very, very anonymous stuff. I, People who freak out over things like that get on my nerves a little bit because one of the things about open source is the fact that if anybody does try and collect very specific information, believe me, there would be a huge outcry and they would scream bloody murder in the community and we would know all about it. So I don't worry about stuff like that. And I think it's a good thing that the folks who are developing Ubuntu are collecting a little bit of statistical information to help them to know where to focus their resources as they develop and maintain Ubuntu. So that's my opinion on this. So let's get into the results. So what is in the user result? Well, what what is in this report? The uh, things that we're not going to get out of this is how many people installed Ubuntu 18.04. Uh, they don't seem to have totals or they're keeping that to themselves for whatever reason. And we don't know anything about the demographics of the people who use Ubuntu because they don't collect any specific information like male or female occupation, what are you using Ubuntu for? We don't know any of that. These are just people who are installing Ubuntu, the options they chose, and a little bit about the hardware they're using. 66% of the people who have installed Ubuntu 18.04 since April have opted in to sending information back to Canonical. So the other uh, folks, they just sent a ping which says, eh, I'm not going to do this. So either way, you're sending a little bit of information to, to Canonical. If you opt out, it just says this person doesn't want to do it. And that way they can maintain statistics about who's opting in, who's opting out, and how many people are installing Ubuntu. But we're not getting that information. It'd be kind of nice to know. This is kind of interesting. Real or virtual machines? Uh, the virtual machines seem to be a smaller percentage, although they didn't break it down in numbers. They just put it in a list little weird little chart here. Uh, and then there were some machines that they absolutely couldn't detect whether it was real or virtual, so they threw those in there. Clean install or upgrade. Now this is interesting to me because more than, uh, well, 80% of the people who installed Ubuntu, they did it as a clean install. Those who are running earlier versions of Ubuntu, uh, only 20% of the folks upgraded from an older version to a newer version. The kind of, I guess, general wisdom that floats around out there is it's always better to do a clean install when you're making a major change, like if you were moving from Ubuntu 16.04 to 18.04. Uh, but I ha also don't have a great deal of information about how well the upgrade process has worked for Ubuntu. They said that they would get that all worked out, see, because Ubuntu 16.04, we're talking about the regular vanilla spin of Ubuntu from Canonical, that used the Unity desktop, and then 18.04, of course, went to the GNOME desktop, kind of a Canonical spin on the GNOME desktop. And I really never got a whole bunch of information about how that upgrade worked. So if anybody wants to put some feedback about that in the comments, that would be kind of cool to see. Did you try an upgrade from 1604 to 1804? If so, how did that work for you? Uh, where are Ubuntu users? They really didn't put any statistics in here. They just gave us a map. It looks like that most of the folks who are using Ubuntu are in the United States, UK, and other places around the world, but they didn't bother to break that down with any kind of numbers. What language do they use? Most people are choosing English at install. About 7% are choosing Spanish. 5% other languages, including French, Portuguese, uh, Chinese, German, Russian, Italian, and Polish. 1% of the people who use Ubuntu speak Polish. 
Ubuntu must be big in Poland because I didn't think that a whole lot of people around the world spoke Polish. Interesting results there. Desktop specs. OS architecture, well, 98% of it is AMD 64. Most of the folks, well, I mean, you can only get a 64-bit version of the regular Ubuntu the normal standard way, so most people are going to be installing that on 64-bit equipment. However, some of the spins for the 1804 released were releasing 32-bit versions, so I guess that's where that 2% comes from. 99% of the people who installed Ubuntu are using X11. That is by default. If you want to use Wayland, you would have to change that at the login screen. And there's a session you know, it says Ubuntu on Wayland. You can choose that, but only 1% of the people out there who installed 1804 chose that, which tells me a lot about the state of Wayland and where it's at. It is not quite ready, folks, and probably won't be ready for another five or 10 years at the rate that it's going. So not terribly worried about that myself. Physical versus virtual machines using UEFI and BIOS. So this is a, a little bit of a deep kind of statistic here. Most folks on physical hardware are using just good old BIOS, which means an MS-DOS style partition scheme. And that's the bootloader is going in at the front of the disk and not having its own separate little partition, as in UEFI. UEFI can be problematic with Linux, but Ubuntu is one of the distributions that is supposed to be able to support UEFI without any issues. I've installed it on UEFI-enabled hardware in the past myself. But it looks like most people are either turning that off or they're using older hardware. That's my suspicion on that one. Of course, with virtual machines using a UEFI in a virtual environment is very rare indeed. What graphics setup do users have? 93% of them have one screen. When That's when you install Ubuntu. That does not reflect the people who install Ubuntu then plug another monitor in afterwards. 94% of them have one CPU. So, uh, well, uh, Excuse me, GPU, not CPU. That would be your graphics card. And, you know, whether you have some people who are really heavily into graphical stuff like video editing, playing games, they might have more than one in the machine. But that looks like only about 6%. Popular screen sizes. 800 by 600 came up with 11%. Now, I would assume there that that is because people are installing in a virtual machine. Because I don't know of many folks who have physical hardware these days with an 800 by 600 screen. That goes back many, many eons uh, to get to that in computer terms. So the first big bump you get is 1366 by 768. Now what that says is that lots and lots of folks are using Ubuntu on small laptops. Because that's a pretty standard screen size on pretty average laptops. And then we have uh, 1080p with the next big bump. That would be people on desktops and uh, most other laptops, I suppose. Uh, so anything above 1080p, very small percentage, which tells you about the state of 4K hardware in the computer world. The support's not 100% there in Linux for 4K. Depends on the desktop, depends on the applications you use. Uh, for me, and I think for a lot of other people, I just look at that and go, eh, I really don't need that, and move on. It's very expensive hardware. So, let us move on and see what we get. What CPU and memory do users have? Now, when we talk about CPUs here, we're talking about cores, uh, the CPU cores, and most people have between one and three. I mean, like 60... 3%, which is a bit shocking. That would mean people who are either using virtual machines with one core enabled or maybe core duos, they're talking about that, or, or three. That's pretty wild. And then 27% have four to six. That would be Intel i3 and above there that you're talking about. And of course, the equivalent for AMD chips. And then people who have seven plus, uh, that would be... Uh, really, I guess, more advanced, like Intel Xeons, some of the later i7s and stuff like that. Guess what? Only 8%. RAM, 1 to 4 gigabytes. 
51% of people out there running Ubuntu, that's how much memory the system is using. 5 to 8, well, that's 31%. And that's kind of covers anywhere between 5 to 8 is pretty much the low end of a laptop or even a, a lower end desktop computer that you would buy these days. They, they're coming between 8 and 16 with uh, as far as how many gigabytes of RAM they have in them. 13% 12 to 24 and only 2% 32 plus some folks have 96 gigabytes of RAM in their machines. What physical disks do people have? Well, this is in size. It'd be kind of neat if they could break it down between uh, spinning disks and SSDs, but they don't collect that information, obviously. So 500 gigabytes and lower, 79% of the people who are running Ubuntu, that's the disk that they are installing Ubuntu on. 500 gigabytes to 2 terabytes, that's only 13% of the people who are installing Ubuntu. And uh, 2 terabytes and above, that's only 7%. That's kind of shocking to me. I think that, you know, because now 2 terabyte disks, they're not terribly expensive. You can buy a spinning disk for, what, between $50 and $75? No big deal. It seems to me that people would have more storage, but that seems to be the way it is. Uh, of course, this could also reflect the fact that a lot of folks have gone to SSD. And uh, what is it, a 512 uh, gigabyte SSD is running... I don't remember. It's somewhere around a hundred bucks, maybe a little bit higher, maybe like a hundred and twenty right now. So maybe that's what that's all about. Who knows? Partition type. So this is what you choose when you install Ubuntu. Most people, fifty-four percent, erase and install. Only twenty-one percent do manual setup of their partitions. Install alongside, eight percent. Eight percent. Erase existing and reinstall, which is kind of almost the same as erase device and install, but not quite. Only 3% choose to use LVM. Uh, makes sense to me. LVM is a complicated mess. I wouldn't touch that thing with a 10-foot pole. Not a fan. Only 3% uh, encrypt the uh, LVM setup that they have, and then upgrade is only 1%. So size of partitions in gigabytes, this, I guess this tells you the uh, typical size of partition once again, or partitions that people choose. Um, so size of partitions looks like greater than one gigabyte here would be 22%, 1 to 19, 18%. Uh, let's see, 13%, um, 20 to 49. So, uh, I, I don't know, that, uh, these statistics don't mean a whole lot to me. I'm kind of <laughs> trying to figure out exactly what I'm looking at on that one. Okay, never mind. Number of partitions, 50% of the people who uh, install Ubuntu have one partition. Of course, that's the default setup when you just say okay erase the disk and it just creates one big happy partition creates like a two gigabyte swap file which it puts in that partition it does not create a swap space on the disk or a swap partition and that's it so most people obviously are opting to just let the system do that and then if you wanted to separate out your home directory well that would be 32 percent of you and if you're doing anything real sexy it's like three and more there I'm trying to figure out what I'm looking at here. Size of partitions, gigabyte, greater than one. Okay. I just, I don't know. That uh, doesn't make sense to me. Configuring Ubuntu, some interesting information here. So users who installed Ubuntu using the default settings, 33%, 61% uh, of people did it in virtual machines. 33% if you were putting it on your real computer, that would be just you didn't change anything at install, and then 61% uh, in virtual machines. Because most people when they're doing virtual machines you don't care, you just put it on there, you're just playing with it anyway. Uh, people who opted out of at least one add-on, 56% 56 physical, 24% virtual, 
And users who auto log in on startup, 29%. I never auto log in, ever. So I always choose to uh, be asked for a password. It's just more, it is just more secure. Users who opted for minimal install, a stripped down Ubuntu that contains a few basic applications 12% physical, 13% on virtual drives, uh, I, virtual uh, machines. I, I would expect that to be bigger, actually. Users who choose to download and update software while installing Ubuntu, 91%. Well, that's automatically checked these days, so I guess that's why they do that. I don't uh, bother with that. I, I, I'd run my updates after I install, because you still have to run updates anyway, right? <laughs> So anyway, there you go. That's uh, pretty much the information that was released. Uh, not a huge change from the uh, original release. It's at, at some point, uh, shortly after the release of Ubuntu uh, 18.04, they released uh, the similar statistics, and we took a look at it here on the channel. Not a huge change, and honestly, not much of you know a big surprise there. Uh, so, looks like that's how people are using Ubuntu. Honestly, I would expect a little higher-end hardware because Ubuntu is kind of a niche system. Most people who do use Ubuntu, they are people who are very much into computers and might be more picky about their hardware. I'm a little bit surprised, but there you go. It looks like Ubuntu is being used on a lot of kind of run-of-the-mill stuff out there. So, anyway, I'm done. Thank you for watching the video. As always, your feedback is welcome. Please join the discussion at Easy Talk. That is a forum for the Easy Linux community. It is free, secure, and fun. Be sure to give Easy Linux a like on Facebook if you are a Facebook user. And also check out easylinux.com. That's where all of this comes together. And you can also send me a personal message directly there by uh, using the contact us page. And then you can also check out freedompenguin.com for more interesting stuff about Linux from contributors such as myself. That's it. We'll do it again soon.